Today on Beers TV, oxygen and hydrogen make up more than 96% of your tank water. Managing these two elements can increase growth by 50%, filling out your tank from frags to colonies in a fraction of the time, while reducing fish and coral mortalities along the way. All that's coming up. Hey, this is Ryan with Beers TV's Master Series, diving in that gap between good, great, and all the progress left on the table. Almost no one spends much time thinking about oxygen and hydrogen, but these two elements might be one of the best examples of a tiny amount of effort having such a huge return. We can do better, and I'm certain of this because I've personally been okay and even recommended some approaches which I would call adequate or even good, but after really taking a deeper look, we're capable of so much more, and I'm certain the fish and corals that I care for will benefit from a very small amount of effort. Only real question is, what does better look like? Is it achievable, worth the effort, and what is the supporting evidence? Today, the two elements that make up nearly all of what's in seawater, oxygen and hydrogen. The liquid water molecule made up of oxygen and hydrogen makes up more than 96% of what's in seawater. That's easily observed when you realize it only takes five gallon bucket of salt into a total of 160 gallons of fresh water to mix up our seawater. However, the water molecule is not the focus of today's discussion. It's what happens when there's too little or too much of the individual hydrogen or oxygen ions introduced to the tank. Starting with hydrogen, which might be the best example in this entire series of what's being left on the table. Nearly everything reefers care about is affected by undesirably high hydrogen concentrations in our tank. Corals grow slower, the skeletal structure is thinner and more fragile. Larval sediment success is dramatically lower. Some organisms' shells and skeletal structures actually slowly dissolve rather than grow, and the corals less capable of dealing with stressful events, which result in much higher mortalities. So why don't you hear about more people actively monitoring and controlling hydrogen? Fact is you do, nearly every reefer's actively controlled hydrogen at some point, but many have had no idea what they were doing or why. That's because it's not called testing hydrogen, it's actually called monitoring and managing pH. The pH of the tank is a measure of the concentration of hydrogen ions in the tank and effectively how acidic or basic the water is. So effectively, our pH tests and probes are measuring the amount of hydrogen ions and resulting acidic compounds like carbonic acid in the tank. The more of them there are, the lower the pH will be. In the past, I've personally felt that as long as we've hit 7.8 to 8.3, we're largely doing okay, but you're about to see why the tank pH and acidity have such profound effects on the tanks and animals that we care for, and why that goal of near 8.3 has more benefits than you may have thought. All this is based around the calcium carbonate-based skeletal structures that corals, coralline algae, and many inverts build. To do that, they pull calcium ions and carbonate ions out of the surrounding water, into their tissue, and then combine and precipitate calcium carbonate to build their skeletal structure. The easier it is for the coral to do this, the stronger and faster growing the skeletal structure will be. The calcium ion's easy, it's just calcium. In relation to the hydrogen, the thought put into the carbonate is where all the benefit is. The carbonate portion of calcium carbonate exists in two forms in the tank, carbonate and bicarbonate. While one might be preferred, carbonate and bicarbonate play nearly identical roles in the reef tank. It's believed that corals can use either to build their calcium carbonate structure. Only difference between carbonate and bicarbonate is bicarbonate has a hydrogen attached. However, that hydrogen is an important distinction and understanding the difference is where all the results show up. The exact mechanism and how corals utilize carbonate or bicarbonate is not fully understood and likely changes between various organisms, but there are two commonly accepted theories within the research community that lands in the same place for our purposes. First, many researchers believe that the corals actually prefer carbonate over bicarbonate simply because they can combine the calcium and carbonate easier and don't have to expend any energy splitting the hydrogen off of that bicarbonate and then pumping the undesirable excess hydrogen out of the coral's tissue. But here's the challenge, there's just a lot more bicarbonate in a reef tank than there is carbonate. They're interchangeable though and they change forms back and forth as they drop and pick up that hydrogen. The tank pH and concentration of hydrogen ions being the number one influencer of that balance, it's not a major leap to grasp the fact if there's more hydrogen in the tank, more of them will attach the carbonate and form bicarbonate. However, if we reduce the concentration of hydrogen ions and related acidic compounds in the tank, the balance shifts back towards carbonate. In a minute, I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. Looking at this chart with a standard reef tank pH range highlighted, you can see the lower end of that range is near 7.8 actually is the peak of bicarbonate concentration. Adding in the carbonate curve, you can see there's very little of the desired energy efficient carbonate forms that exist at 
However, when we look at the higher range of common reef tank pHs and resulting lower hydrogen concentrations near 8.3, we see the ratio shifts. While most of the ratio is still weighted to bicarbonate, there's roughly four times as much of the preferred carbonate at 8.3 than 7.8, and it's just a fairly easy to understand concept. When an organism's preferred compound is depleted by as much as four times as the concentration of its natural environment, there will likely be a related decrease in overall metabolic health of the animal. Okay, so if that wasn't compelling enough, there's actually a second layer to this. What happens if the coral is forced to use the bicarbonate instead? Well, it's fully capable of splitting off that hydrogen. However, the net result of that is the hydrogens collect within the coral's tissue, just like the water surrounding the coral. When the concentration of the hydrogen increases, the fluids within the coral becomes more acidic and the pH of the fluid inside the coral drops. Now resolve that increase in acidity or lower pH within the coral's tissue is it's much harder to precipitate calcium carbonate, meaning slower growing coral and thinner, weaker, or more brittle skeletal structure. In the worst cases where the internal pH becomes very low, it's possible that existing skeletal structure could start to deteriorate or weaken. So the coral obviously needs to rid itself of that excess hydrogen and acidity from using bicarbonate, and more or less, it just pumps it right back into the surrounding water. That's comparatively easy to do at a pH of 8.3, where the concentration of hydrogen in the tank water is fairly low. However, way down at 7.8, where the tank's concentration of hydrogen ions is four times higher, it's much harder for the coral to rid itself of that internal acidity or hydrogen. The coral has to work substantially harder to do so, and it's likely overall less effective at doing so overall. Okay, so how much does all this matter, and is 8.3 substantially different than 7.8 in terms of clearly identifiable results? The most compelling and quickest look at this is do a quick Google search of the effects of ocean acidification on coral reefs. You'll find hundreds, if not thousands of articles, every last one of them agreeing that the lowering pH of the ocean changes the lifespan and trajectory of not just a coral, but an entire reef. Many agreeing that this will happen with a consistent change of as little as 0.1 pH. Okay, so what about an artificial environment like our reef tanks? A majority of reef tanks range from 0.3 to 0.6 points lower than most ocean reefs, which is much higher than that 0.1 many researchers suggest as a negative threshold in the ocean. I can tell you right now that that 0.3 to 0.6 difference is affecting the tank. The first place you'll notice is day one, when you start maintaining a pH similar to a healthy ocean reef, you'll often see a dramatic increase in calcium and alkalinity consumption by the corals. The 100 milliliter dose of additives that you did yesterday may need to be 120 or even 150 the day after, the direct result of the corals growing faster and a more robust skeletal structure. To get a more detailed view into this, we did a Beers TV investigates in a controlled environment where redundant tanks at 7.8 versus 8.3 and showed nearly 50% higher growth rates by weight. The corals were obviously visually much larger as well. I believe most reefers would agree 50% faster growth related to natural seawater levels qualifies as a worthwhile endeavor, and those type of results mirror the scientific community's beliefs that increasing the acidity of the water will produce slower growth, brittle skeletal structures, more susceptible to damage, it requires more metabolic energy to do so, and the coral is less capable of withstanding stressful events, increasing long-term mortalities. So here's the real kicker. When I first saw all the benefits from our experiments and maintaining an 8.3 on the 160, I chalked it all up to the optional benefit of elevating pH. Just another thing you could do if you wanted to. However, a more accurate way to depict this is slow growing corals, that thin brittle skeletal structure and likely increase in related periodic unexplained mortalities. It's a direct result of the corals growing in water that is significantly more acidic than their natural environment in the ocean. So elevating the tank back to 8.3 is more solving a known problem than it is adding a benefit. That leads to the next obvious question. Why is the pH in our reef tanks lower than the ocean? Well, there's a variety of contributing factors to that, including higher concentrations of decaying organics in the tank, and maybe poorly maintained alkalinity, but in a typical reef tank with a decent approach to maintaining alkalinity, there's one direct cause that accounts for a vast, vast majority of pH issues. That's carbon dioxide. That'd be excess carbon dioxide production in the tank itself, but more often, it's excess carbon dioxide in your home from pets and people breathing. Typical outdoor carbon dioxide or CO2 concentrations is 350 to 450 parts per million, but indoors, it's often two to three times that as much as 1,000 parts per million. 
So as the top of the tank turns over and water passes through the skimmer, that elevated CO2 in the room is being added to the tank. When it hits a tank, the CO2 combines with the hydrogen or water or H2O to form carbonic acid, effectively lowering the tank's pH. So know this, as long as alkalinity in your tank is maintained properly, your pH issues almost certainly one of two things and they should be checked on first. Either there isn't enough gas exchange in the tank from your flow or skimmer to rid the tank of excess CO2 being produced by the organisms in the tank, or there's too much CO2 in the surrounding room, the later being the most common culprit, but these are the first two things that should be checked on because it's very likely your cause and every other low pH cause gets increasingly obscure. Okay, so what's our solution to all this? First, everyone can move out of the house or just stop breathing. But since that's not gonna happen, we can look for other CO2 management solutions. There's tons of them and most are very low cost to implement. First, we wanna identify if it's actually poor gas exchange in the tank or if it's elevated CO2 in the room. Now that you know what to look for, common sense comes into play here. If you already know you have low flow in the tank and almost no tank turnover at the surface, fix that. But in general, you should be able to take a pH measurement today and then aim most of your power heads at the surface, create as much turnover and gas exchange as possible, and then measure at the exact same time the following day. The pH rises, flow, and gas exchange is part of your issue. Consider how many power heads you have, where they're placed, to create as much gas exchange between the tank water and surrounding air as possible. You can even consider a higher powered skimmer as well. There's a good chance that that didn't solve it or it ends up being only a partial solution because most homes do have elevated CO2. The method of identifying that is simple. Open up some windows and turn on a fan to vent the excess CO2 outdoors. This should solve the issue within 24 hours. If it does, you now know the cause. I'm so confident that as long as alkalinity is maintained properly, that CO2 is going to be the cause of your issue that I'll share. If your test kit or pH probe says it isn't, there's a good chance that it's the probe or test kit that's giving inaccurate readings. However, now that you know, there's also a reality that most of us can't leave our windows open all the time. The more tightly sealed the house is, the more people breathing, the more pets breathing, the bigger the issue will be. So here's a list of ways to compensate for the unavoidable fact that many of us will have elevated CO2 in our homes. Since all of these can be effective on their own, starting from the lowest cost and working our way up, First, just drill a hole in your wall and feed your skimmer with air from the outside, which doesn't have that excess CO2. In most cases, a decent protein skimmer produces the most air-water gas exchange in the tank. There are millions or even billions of these little bubbles in a skimmer, and in most cases, creating exponentially more surface area than the top of the tank itself. So simply drawing in fresh outdoor air into the skimmer can solve many people's pH challenges entirely. Two downsides to plan for with this is a long air line run to your skimmer will reduce how much air it sucks in and the skimmer's performance. However, the net overall gain of the tank may be positive as long as nutrients don't start to increase in the tank. Second, don't pull out their air from anywhere where there's obvious sources of pollution. That can be a car tailpipe, idle snowblower, or lawnmower, insecticides, fertilizers, or weed killer. In fact, many people will put a carbon reactor on the intake as a precaution, but that will add head pressure as well. So the lowest cost, easiest, and nearly effective way, but like anything, account for the challenges for best results. The second option here is add some plants to the room. I've never done this myself, but I've heard dozens of accounts where just adding some plants to the room or home soaks up the excess CO2 as part of natural photosynthesis. Obviously the size of the room, home, number, type, or size of plants, and the amount of light or care they receive having a direct impact on the effectiveness of how much CO2 they pull out as long as you're good with plants, have a decent amount of sunlight entering the room, I'd say this is probably the easiest solution with near zero downsides and worth a try. Third is calcium and alkalinity additives. Kalkwasser or calcium hydroxide is probably the most well-known effective solution for elevating pH with an additive. Either dripped in the tank or sometimes with an auto top off, Kalkwasser is very often an entire solution on its own. Many two parts based on soda ash or sodium carbonate will increase the pH and often a partial solution. Some two parts based on sodium hydroxide or lye will raise it even more, but also somewhat dangerous to deal with. I personally wouldn't recommend sodium hydroxide or lye unless you have a history of chemical safety and long-term respect for how this chemical can harm those in your household. This risk for your tank is actually similar as well. The stronger the effect the additive has in the pH, the higher the long-term risk of equipment failure and overdosing is as well. 
Doing this safely long term is often tied to a pH controller and will be covered in detail with our master kelk washer, master two parts, and other additive episodes in this chemistry series. This is a good time to note that there are dozens of products out there called pH buffer or pH up or something similar. If you have fish only tank, they can be a decent solution, but most are a poor choice for use in a reef tank because they interfere with how reefers dose and test for alkalinity. Unless the pH buffer or pH up product explicitly explains why it's good for a reef tank and won't interfere with dosing or testing alkalinity, I wouldn't use it myself or recommend it to anyone for use on a reef tank. The fourth option is a refugium, most commonly growing catomorpha in your sump or algae reactor. What happens here is as the cato grows, it soaks up excess carbon dioxide in the tank. How effective it is, is dependent on two things, the size of the refugium and the intensity or spectrum of the light. If you drive higher rates of photosynthesis, you'll drive faster CO2 uptake as well. But I've seen this effective in all kinds and sizes of installs, ranging from a hang-on fuge with a tunes grow strip to much larger installs. My number one recommended light for this is the Kessel A360 Grow Light, which loans all of their technology and knowledge from the horticulture division over at Kessel. The AI Prime Fuge and the Tunes Grow Strip, less powerful, but more affordable options as well. One note is most people will run refugiums at night, and this is a good time to note that the pH in most reef tanks will be lower at night because the corals and algae in the tank are not consuming excess CO2 because the lights in the tank are not on and driving photosynthesis in the tank. However, running the fuge at night will combat that nightly pH drop trend, a higher power fuge, often completely eliminating that daily swing between day and night. The refugium is another pH solution which has nearly no downsides. In fact, the fuge has all kinds of upsides with nutrient control and beneficial microfauna populations. Because of that, this is one of my top recommendations for anyone looking to actively control pH. The fifth and potentially most precise option is a CO2 scrubber. In this case, it works like venting your skimmer outside, but instead of running a line outside, you take the skimmer's air intake and feed it from a CO2 scrubber which has CO2 absorbing media in it, effectively eliminating one of the major sources of CO2 injection into the tank. This can be more costly than some of the other options because you need to replace the color changing media periodically. That said, the $20 to $40 a month might have the highest return on dollar of almost all the ongoing expenditures for the tank, especially if you have a lot of coral or value filling out the tank faster because there just aren't many things that will increase growth rates as much as 50%. However, there are reefers out there trying recirculating CO2 scrubber designs to dramatically reduce the media costs, and this is an advancement that might ultimately end up being the best and most widely used pH solution out there in future years. I mentioned this is the most precise option because with the use of solenoids or pinch valves in a pH or aquarium controller, it's very easy to peg the pH at the exact number you want, 24-7, 365. None of the other options discussed earlier will do that, at least not as easy or as reliably. The last option is the most expensive and not realistic for most people, but you can add an air exchanger to the HVAC system. This will automatically swap indoor air with outdoor air in an energy efficient manner, managing both the venting of household air, but also replacing the makeup air. The one temptation that I would resist is putting a fan in the wall and having it turned on periodically because you're gonna create a vacuum in the house which will mess with your water heater, your furnace, and all that air actually needs to come back in from somewhere. So in hot weather or cold weather, it's actually gonna mess with your HVAC as well. So oxygen issues are coming up in just a second, but these are a half dozen solutions, all effective, ranging in different costs, risks, and effort, but most of them will solve your tank's elevated hydrogen, undesirable acidity, and realize all the benefits of maintaining a pH closer to natural ocean levels. However, that really is only part of the H2O discussion that we're solving today. Oxygen is the other part of H2O, but I also found independently as a vital gas in the tank. The number one concern here is respiration, particularly with the fish. Respiration transfers the oxygen to the living tissue and at the same time releases CO2 as a waste. To demonstrate how important this is, take a moment, hold your breath, and 60 seconds from now, you'll see exactly how critical this process really is. Effect is same for the fish. Low oxygen levels will stress the fish, make them more susceptible to disease, and in worst cases, suffocate them. Luckily, elevated and depleted oxygen levels are fairly rare in a reef aquarium. That's because most of the introduction of oxygen and regulation comes from moving water being exposed to the air in the room. Most reef tanks have a tremendous amount of gas exchange with power heads rolling the surface of the water and potentially even more impactful protein skimmers which mix that frothy air and water into a foam. So as long as there's reasonable oxygen levels in the room your reef tank is in, you're probably good.
The major concern with oxygen is actually what happens during power outages and equipment failure, both of which are inevitable. A vast majority of power outages are just a matter of hours, and things like light, filtration, heat are not mission critical, but oxygen is. Without it, the fish will start to die. Once the first one goes, the rest go rapidly after. This is a prime instance where planning for the inevitable will dramatically increase the long-term success rates. The reason the oxygen levels drop is because during a power outage, the skimmer, return pump, and power heads all stop working. There's no flow to break the surface tension of the water, gas exchange, or redistribution of oxygen-rich water throughout the tank ceases. We have several highly effective solutions for this. Cobalt makes an air stone driven option that detects the loss of power, starts bubbling air into the water, and can last up to 72 hours, meaning you don't have to be there or be awake to have it work when you need it, and it's only 40 bucks. That said, air stones have limitations because they only add oxygen to the water in the vicinity of the bubble, so you might want more than one for larger tanks. Most fish will naturally be drawn to the oxygen-rich water, and with a bit of common sense placement and the right number of them, a solution like this will actually solve at least half of the power outages out there and protect your fish, the 40 bucks a legit solution for many power outages. A better option is a battery backup for your power heads. I say better option because the battery backup will also turn on automatically during a power outage and you don't have to be there. The power heads break the surface of the air water interface at the surface of the tank, provides better gas exchange than a stream of bubbles, and even more importantly, the water flow distributes the oxygen throughout the entire tank. A battery backup can mean something as simple as plugging in your power heads into a UPS for a computer. Randy's investigates showed that most of the traditional UPS lasts between three and nine hours, depending on size, cost, and age of the unit. A large, very expensive option might go longer. However, some of the better DC aquarium powerhead options out there have their own battery backup solutions, which can last days to even weeks. The Vortec is easily the most popular. Install is just a plug and play cord for up to 72 hours of runtime. They can even be daisy chained if you want more. The Tunes has what they call a safety connector, which runs their DC pumps during a power outage. In this case, you get your own battery, which can be cheaper and allows you to get whatever size that you want. Some of the gyres also have battery backup options as well. To be blunt, a good battery backup option is what takes a good pump and makes it great. At this point, I wouldn't even consider a power head that doesn't have some sort of battery backup option. Ignoring the inevitable puts you on an inevitable path. There's also the option of a generator, but note you have to be there to start it. It only works if you maintain it and has a significant upfront cost. There are options including natural gas generators, which start automatically, but increasingly expensive. Considering how much time we all spend away from our homes or sleeping, if it doesn't start automatically, a generator might be a better option for long-term outages than short-term, or used even better with a battery backup option as a combined solution. As to which one that you invest in first, consider the history of your area. Are power outages typically a matter of hours or days? The more acute but rare causes of oxygen issues in the tank are often the result of medications, pest removal additives, and anything that can promote a bacterial bloom, all of which can rapidly strip the tank of oxygen, so make sure to read the instructions and take those warnings seriously. However, an excellent flow solution and skimmer will combat all but the biggest types of mistakes here. For those that want to monitor oxygen directly, many controllers like the Apex have dissolved oxygen probes. I'll say this is one of the least popular modules because it's expensive. The only time that I would personally consider this is if I had a lot of really expensive fish. In this case, it might be well worth the cost. The next question is what about the other major minor trace elements in seawater? What kind of success is being left on the table there? The master chemistry playlist is right here, but all of our master reef tank playlists, including the popular master lighting, can be found on our channel page right here.